the science of Rick and Morty because some of Rick's science is kind of sort of real-ish. Up next on Science Goes to the Movies. Welcome to Science Goes to the Movies, a look at the stories of science and how they change our culture. I'm Lisa Beth Kovitz. If you missed him at Comic-Con, our guest Matt Brady has written an extraordinary, fun-to-read book called The Science of Rick and Morty. He's also the founder of thescienceof.org and a high school science teacher. Hello, Mr. Brady. Hi. Thanks for, thanks for having me. Delighted to have you here. If you haven't seen it, Rick and Morty is, well... It's a late-night cartoon network show created by Justin Roiland and Dan Harmon based on Roiland's short, The Animated Adventures of Doc and Marty, a parody of Back to the Future. You can find that short on Roiland's Vimeo account, but after, like, the first 48 seconds, you wouldn't be allowed to show it on broadcast TV because it suggests that oral sex is a cure-all for all of Marty's various troubles. The Rick and Morty on Cartoon Network's Adult Swim still has an enormous number of testicles in the animation, but it also has a significant amount of science. How would you describe the, the real science in Rick and Morty? The real science in Rick and Morty is handled with an amount of respect. Uh, it's, it's part of the story in many ways, um, but more often than not, it's, it's not fictionalized to the extreme, to the ridiculous extent where, oh, everyone gets their superpowers through dark matter uh, <laughs> or, or some other kind of place where you can tell that the, the writers really aren't sure too much what's going on. It's used, and it's used in many, time, many cases properly. It's mentioned, the multiverse, um, wormholes. They're, they're mentioned with, as I said, amount of respect to the science. In Rick and Morty, a humanoid bug species called the Gromflites seems to have taken over all upper management positions at the Galactic Federation. They're sort of a cross between house flies and praying mantis, except they also have testicles because Rick and Morty. Here on Earth, did we ever have insects as big as the Gromflites? As big as the Gromflites, they're shown to be about as tall as humans. Um, Maybe we had, really? but ours were down on the ground. We had eight foot long uh, millipedes in the Carboniferous period. Uh, we had dragonflies with wingspans that were three or four feet wide. But the Carboniferous period was a different time. Well, so could a Gromphalite come to Earth and live now? Well, the reason why we had large alien, aliens, large insects, <laughs> uh, it's all about how insects breathe. Insects don't have lungs. They have just openings called tracheae that the air comes in passively and goes across their membranes where it diffuses, kind of like what happens inside our lungs, but we mechanically pull the air in and push it back out. Insects just have these openings and the air moves back and forth. Sometimes they can move their bodies a little bit and aid it, uh, but it's a passive process. That's a problem now. It wasn't a problem in the Carboniferous when oxygen levels in the atmosphere were higher. They were towards 35% compared to 21% now. So the process was still the same as far as we know with just the tracheae and the holes and the spiracles would allow the air in, but there was more oxygen in that air. Over time, things changed, different plant life went up, came down, carbon dioxide increased in our atmosphere, oxygen therefore went down as a part of it. So now we have about 21% uh, oxygen in our atmosphere. That allows for, I think our biggest insects are about maybe 60 centimeters long, stick bugs that are that big. Uh, so insects can't do things when they get that big, they're getting really slow as well. Oh. But uh, you stay small, you can stay fast. Think of a cockroach. But as you get larger, it gets harder for them to provide gas exchange for their tissues. Um, so back to the gromphalites. Who knows? Perhaps the Gromphalites, if they are truly insects, you know, sometimes they wear clothes, <laughs> which would cover up those, those holes, which would be troublesome for them, I think. Um, but maybe they don't need all the oxygen that we're used to our bugs needing. Maybe they can get by with the 21%. We haven't really seen that much of their action on Earth, um, but maybe they, maybe they have little cannula with shooting some oxygen up their 
into their spiracles, up their nose. They don't have noses. Maybe <laughs> they should have developed lungs instead of testicles. It, it, it probably would have helped them a little bit if they wanted to become an invasive species and go all around. But that's a problem when you see, again, when we talk about tropes, when you see large insects, something right. like starship troopers, giant insect type creatures, how are they, how are they breathing? How, how could they manage it? How are they breathing our air? Right, right. How are they breathing our air? Because our air isn't going to give them enough oxygen to supply their tissues and their, all their body systems with the oxygen they need. That's so interesting. Yeah. Thank goodness for teachers. <laughs> Rick and Morty takes place in a multiverse, and the Rick and Morty we started following in season one are from dimension C-137. Is C-137 a, a random number that the creators pick to name their universe? It is so not. It is an Easter egg. Uh, 137 of all the numbers they could have picked, 137 uh, has a specific meaning, but it's something that kind of is an Easter egg, or as some more passionate fans like to call it, it's the IQ, one of the IQ tests of Rick and Morty. Do you deserve to watch this show? Are you smart <laughs> enough to know what it is? Um, the 137 that's in there is the fine structure constant. It's a number that is constant. Um, it, it's just a, a number that shows up and it shows up over and over again in, in physics. Um, and that can be comforting or it can be alarming, depending on how you look at it. Um, comforting in the idea that maybe something, someone signed their name to the work um, or alarming that why is there this number over and over again. Now the number has to do with a couple different things where it's easy to spot the, the amount, uh, kind of how electrons interact with their atoms and also with how strong the electromagnetic force, the positive and negative attractive force, how strong that is. So if this 137 were larger, then your electromagnetic force would be stronger and as a result, atoms would pull in tighter and life as we know it wouldn't exist. Wait, so, are, so we right here and now, we are a universe defined by 137? We are. That's the, that's the fine structure constant. That, that is one of the rules that we have to live by. If, if that number was weaker, if the electromagnetic force was weaker, then there wouldn't be a strong a, a pull between electrons and protons, and atoms would start to, or just fly apart. And if your atoms fly apart, then there's nothing. So if the Rick and Morty we're following are from a dimension defined by the number 137, does that mean that they have to be in our dimension defined by 137, or are there a lot of 137s? That's where it gets hazy, and I think that's where, where uh, Dan Harmon and Justin Roiland, the creators, I think that's where they don't want to be pinned down, and the fans, and, and certainly probably fueled by the book a little bit, might want to pin them down on that kind of question. Um, but to pin them down, then it starts, they have to have rules. And I don't think they want to have rules when you write something like Rick and Morty. If we say that Rick and Morty happens in a multiverse, and if we also say that, well, there's an infinite number of multiverses, as Rick has said, I can get, there's an infinite number of Mortys out there, or Summers, I can always find another one. Um, then there's an infinite number of 137 universes. There's an infinite number of 137 universes which are just a little bit different. Why one is 137 and he seems to be, as he calls himself, the Rickest Rick of all, that's, again, I think that's something that Dan and Justin have put in there and I kind of, part of me, part of me hopes I can find out a reason for it. Part of me hopes they never say a reason for it and just say, it is what it is. We're going to tell stories. Well, the Rick and Morty that we started out with, mm -hmm left their original universe and they are they Cronenberg that universe they, they, they Cronenberg their in their uh, universe. Rick Potion number nine and had to get out right so they jumped to another one which was extremely similar to the point of probably we wouldn't be able to tell the difference except that that Rick and Morty died right and they just jumped in and kind of dark at the same time yeah it was it was one over 137 is sometimes called Summerfield's constant or the fine structure constant, and it is considered in physics to be one of the dimensionless physical constants, but is this fine structure constant constant? Are we morphing into something else? As far as we know, it's constant. There, there will always be, and this is a sign of a healthy science, there will always be those who will say, no, I think it might be a bit different, it might be a bit different here, we might be off on it here. It probably was different at the moment in a few microseconds after the Big Bang, uh, where the particles were just forming. Um, it may change as time goes on towards the end of the universe. It's hard to say. 
uh, but if it's going to be labeled constant, it's, it's going to be constant for a good long while and has been constant as, as far as we like to understand it. Science can do a lot, um, but I think science gets a bit troubled when things like constants start to shake and wobble and become mm. 136 all mm. of a sudden, but and we, we should, can't find a reason. We should feel comfortable getting a 137 tattoo on us. And I think so. If you ever plan to go hopping across multiverses just in case somebody finds <laughs> you and needs to send you home. <laughs> if lost, please yeah, return, please return, to, return 137. to one of the multiverses where the fine, fine structure constant's 137. I'll be okay. I'm getting that. <laughs> Some physicists have dedicated their whole lives to the number 137. Matt dedicated all of Chapter 8. And if you want to know more, check out the book because we are moving on. And there are so many places to go. But I think we need to talk about Pickle Rick. Matt, you're a teacher, so I'm just going to hit you with some true or false statements. Ready? Go. Okay. Um, it is possible to turn yourself into a pickle in order to avoid family counseling. False on the turn yourself into a pickle. True people do want to avoid family counseling. What about you can you can remote control a cockroach by licking its brain? Licking I wouldn't go for because it's a little bit unsanitary maybe. <laughs> but controlling a cockroach's brain is surprisingly easier than you might think. I'm not sure if you've given it much thought at all. Um, the, the cockroach brain has been studied a lot and it turns out, and there are a lot of different research groups who have done this, that if you can get into that part of its, what we would call brain, or the different ganglia, which go run up and down its body and control its motor functions, you can control that cockroach. One of the easier ways to do this is that you get a little kit and uh, take a cockroach, good old American cockroach, anesthetize the cockroach by putting it in a cup of ice, that slows it down, clip off its antenna, kind of close to the root, then you insert these two little electrodes into the antenna that are attached to this little backpack looking thing. You cement the backpack thing onto the cockroach. Make sure with a little bit of rubber cement that those electrodes don't come out of the antenna stubs that are there. The little backpack has a battery on it. It connects wirelessly to an app on your phone. And then you can uh, stimulate one of the electrodes by pressing one side of your phone. So if I press the right side of the app, it gives a stimulus to the right antenna through that electrode. That cockroach senses that stimulus, thinks there's something there or some reason I need to get away from that side and will turn to the left. Oh Do it on the left and that cockroach will turn to the right and you can drive a cockroach with the app on your phone. There's a company that makes these out of Ann Arbor, Michigan called Backyard Brains and they will, they will sell you everything that you need. Now, the, the idea of this, and we can, calling them cyborg cockroaches is a little bit gross and creepy, and everyone starts I'm to- Starting with RC cockroaches. RC cockroaches, <laughs> maybe. Biobots is what, it, it's kind of like a, a, an insect neutral term, to, <laughs> but it's uh, robots that are modeled on biology, uh, bio mimicking what biology and what nature has given us. And the idea of this, you know, these biobots and remote controlled cockroaches, it's like, why? Why do we need that? The Army has developed a cockroach robot called the CRAM, C-R-A-M, acronym, robot, which is modeled after a cockroach. And if you know cockroaches, they can squeeze into anything, wedge their body in, push it apart, go in, push it apart, go in, until they're through. These little robots can do the same thing and move guided by you or hopefully one day autonomously. And yes, it's creepy, but What's on the other side of that barrier that they squeeze into? There could be somebody in there who a building fell down on. Right. And they need to see if there are people in there. What can you put on that cockroach? You can put a microphone. You can put a little camera on that microphone, on the cockroach. You can put all kinds of stuff. So wait a minute. Are, are we talking like Day of the Dolphin, you know, a live bug? Or are we talking uh, a, a, a wholly robotic bug that there looks are, like a... There are both camps. The, the cram robot is an actual robot that they're prototyping that can do things. The biobots, kind of with Day of the Dolphin, um, or putting things, backpacks on rats as well, the same idea of controlling, having these as our agents for rescue missions or who knows what. Listen, man, this is, we're, we're shooting from New York City, so we got tons of cockroaches. We have an army here, ready, willing to go. <laughs> Get those rats doing something <laughs> better than just chewing up Make the garbage. the rats hunt the cockroaches. <laughs> <laughs> There won't be anything left in the city. We'll lose <laughs> so much biomass. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> in 
In season two, episode six, The Ricks Must Be Crazy, Rick reveals that he has grown a microverse, only to force it to become the battery that powers his spaceship. It's not practical on so many levels, but in your book, you reflect on some cosmologists who think it might be possible to actually grow a small universe. Right, right. The, the idea is called cosmogenesis, which is this wonderful kind of almost Jack Kirby comic book space science type sounding thing, but it's real. Cosmogenesis is a real thing in, in this high energy physics. The idea is that you take a seed particle, and the one that's theorized is you take a monopole, something that only has one pole. Magnets have two poles, north and south, that's a dipole. A monopole only has one pole. These are theorized to exist, we haven't found them yet. But you take something like that as a seed particle, put it in a particle accelerator, spin out your particles up to high energy and shoot it and put enough energy into that monopole that it would start inflating like our universe did at the start of the Big Bang. Um, but the idea is that it wouldn't just suddenly start growing and pushing everything off the desk of the physicist who did this, that it would open up a wormhole and go in and start making, I see the skepticism in your eyes, and it would start <laughs> to, it would form this new universe and expand into this new part of space. I mean, it's fascinating, but the monopole is is only is a theoretically existing right. particle, right? And it would, and, and let me understand: would it be attract because it's a monopole? Is it attracting other things to it, or is it put energy into it? Then it would start to expand and start to inflate, which is agrees with the ideas of how our Big Bang started—that it just was the inflation process and space. So you spent a great deal of your life in comic books, <laughs> professionally, and you spent a great deal of your professional life in science. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like they're just crossing each other all over the place? That they're just sometimes. Yeah, I, I mentioned Jack Kirby earlier. He, along with Stan Lee, created much of the Marvel universe, the, the New Gods for DC, and all these kind of big cosmological things. And yeah, there are times you can look at. Kirby's work, other work that's in comics, and kind of go, that was 50 years ago, and we have this kind of stuff now. Yeah. My, my thought with Jack Kirby is that he, he could see the future. That's kind of my metaphysical thought of him. He could see the future, but it was through his own lens. And right. so he gave us these artistic interpretations of these right. things that he saw that maybe we couldn't recognize then, but as the science catches up, it's like, Kirby thought of that, wow. But we need him. Because we need him to have thought those things because it would be extremely discomforting if we hadn't had those rehearsals. Right, right. We need to imagine our future. Mm. That's something that people my age and, and, and even younger, we grew up with Star Trek. Right. And right. you could go to NASA or JPL now and walk in the control room and just say, okay, how many of y'all watch Star Trek as kids? and just watch all the hands go up. Right, sure. We all have communicators in our pockets. You know, we all have the pads <laughs> that, that were on the Enterprise of the Next Generation. We do. We imagine our future, and that's what I think we're doing now with the Marvel movies, with other technology, and other movies and shows that we see. I went into the Nokia store and saw if I could go like this <laughs> when I got my first flip phone. Yeah, it's always, it w I, I don't understand why we still don't have, why <laughs> Apple has gotten us away from flip phones. <laughs> Rick builds his universe to serve himself, but jumping back to our earlier conversation about evolution, does anything ever evolve to serve anything other than their own survival? Not really. You, you change to meet the demands of your environment, and if you can't do that, you don't live. And so all evolution is directed by that of I need to, or my species needs to adapt to the environment and the challenges and the stresses that this environment is putting on me, or on it. Um, and if I can't do that, then right. that's it. And that's one of the interesting things when you consider evolution with the multiverse as well, of how can you get the same thing? When Rick and Morty jumped to the other planet, it was a planet that evolved exactly the same as this planet over here. And that was one of the strange things, and I asked, uh, Dr. Losos about that because Stephen Jay Gould, the biologist, famous biologist, uh, was one of his most intriguing concepts he said about evolution was that if you wind the tape back and let it run again, humans wouldn't be here because evolution is just a collection of random processes, random chance. Um, and, and so I put it to Dr. Losos of, well, how can we have different multiverses where you get the same thing over and over again? And 
he gently said that's not what Stephen Jay Gould was thinking of, but it, it is possible if you have all the same particles. I think the idea is statistical that there's an, if there's an infinite number, then there will be... Right, there's an infinite, and, and that's the kind of wrapping your brain around the idea of infinity. If there's an infinite number of multiverses, then, then how, many multi, how many worlds are there where you and I are having this exact same conversation on this exact same date in this exact same place. But not looking as good. Probably not, but there's an <laughs> infinite number. And how many, are, how many worlds are there out with, we're doing this, but we're underwater and speaking through our gills. We're right. not speaking through our gills, we need those to breathe. Right. But there would be an infinite number. Right, right, right. So evolution could happen that way, in theory, if you have the same things over and over and over again to infinity. As of yet, we don't know why Rick came to live with his daughter Beth or who Beth's mother Diane is, but it does seem that their lives were forever changed the moment Rick Sanchez C-137 tested the prototype of his portal gun. In his book, Matt Brady not only has pointed out that the portal glows different colors depending on where Rick is going, but he's also broken down the component parts of the gun, which leads me to think... You know how the portal gun works. I, I, I do not know how a portal gun works. I can put together some ideas, and that's what I did in the book, was to we'll say we need, we need to, if we assume that the portals are wormholes, mm -hmm. which we've theorized should exist, have not seen, have not found, but they're not explicitly not allowed to exist, according to Einstein's theories of relativity. Um, so we need a wormhole. We need to guide that wormhole. We'd need to know where it was going to open up. We'd need energy to make all this happen. And we need to stabilize that wormhole. Each one of those things is a thousand year problem for science, for physics. Easy. And so, yeah, while any joker such as myself can write a book and say, here's how you make one, the idea is like, yeah, but how are we going to do that? Stabilizing a wormhole, that's just a theory. That's a theory if we can even find a wormhole. So, so what missing bits of information does science not have to make Rick's portal gun actually happen? I'm only taking notes, <laughs> you know, for, for friends. All of them. All <laughs> of them. <laughs> uh, wormholes themselves, as I said, we haven't spotted them yet. But, but while, while I can say we haven't spotted wormholes yet, wind the clock back. There would be a time when we'd be sitting here and they'd be cranking the cameras at us and I'd say, black holes are just a theory. <laughs> we haven't seen one yet. But... They were predicted to be out there. And sure enough, when we looked and looked in the right place and looked in the right ways, we found one. And we took a picture of one earlier this year. Wormholes are predicted to be out there. And we're still learning how do we look for them? What exactly are we looking for? Are they open for a long time, as we see in science fiction? Or are they open and closed real fast, just very, very transient things? And then the ideas of wormholes, if it exists, how do we, how do we make it safe? How do we open it and keep it open because it wants to close up again. And that's the whole idea of exotic matter. And then, of course, the energy that it would require to create a wormhole on demand and make that exotic matter and also figure out where it's going to be. Rick's pretty precise with that. And I think that's one of the, the hidden or maybe it's obvious um, ideas of the whole series is that Rick figured that out. Even though the Galactic Federation has portal technology and the president had portal technology, it is clunky, it uses a right. lot of energy, and it really comes across as dangerous. Right. Rick can just open up a portal, walk through it, and be anywhere else. Right, he, he has a portable portal gun. Imagine if you were head of the Galactic Federation, if it was still standing, if you were the head of the Galactic Federation and you could put portal guns on the hips of all your soldiers, you would change the entire universe. Well, so that, that leads to my next question. If we could make a portal gun, should we make a portal gun? I think that, that question gets answered in, in Rick and Morty almost every episode. Just because Rick can, should he? You get to see what happens when he does. Rick potion number nine. Just because Rick can make a love potion for Morty, should he have? Can he? he just because he can make his dog exactly, a little more sentient. Exactly. He burned off whole worlds doing yeah. that. So that's, that's the eternal question. When we talked about creating universes, there's many people who are... S the one saying, yeah, we can, we can probably figure out one day how to create a universe in a lab. Should we? And who's in charge of that universe? And how can we set up rules in that universe? And what if life evolves in that universe? And what if time runs differently and we can actually see that happen? 
there's lots of we can, but should we? When they built that, you, when, they, when they made life out of chemicals, how quickly did they shut it down? It ran its course. I'm not exactly sure how long it ran its course for, um, but it was, that's what they wanted to see. They didn't want to develop life. That was not the idea at all. And I think, realistically, they knew they weren't going to be able to do that. Look how long the Earth had to mm. stew. That was millions and millions of years. Right, right, right. These guys were just working in the 50s and ultimately wanted to get home and <laughs> have dinner. It wasn't a day, but it wasn't, it wasn't years and years. Matt, thanks so much for spending time with us. My pleasure. I thanks really for me. And I really enjoyed your book. Thank you. Thanks a lot.